Amir Ansari and Kyra Everston. Do's and don'ts when building an accessible app. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Great. Um, thanks for the intros, you've just saved us 30 seconds. And welcome to... And welcome to Antarctica until they become Sah uh, the Sahara Desert. So we're a bit freezing up here. So if we do both shiver, it's part of the talk. Um, look, this is not going to be a technical talk, although we are in a technical stream. This is a talk about pragmatism. So um, there's a lot of work done around the web. The web's quite mature when it comes to accessibility. But Transpire, and in particular, you know, Kira and myself for the past few years, have had a lot of our focus around building mobile applications. So we thought it's only fair for us to talk about our experiences, our screw-ups, and our successes building mobile apps. Probably the only takeaway you need to take at the end of this talk is to just do the best you can until you can do better. But we'll get stuck into the talk now. So that's me on the right. Um, Amir Ansari, I am the Head of User Experience at Transpire. I'm Kira Everston and I'm one of the senior UX designers at Transpire as well. So, what is Transpire? We're not going to spend too much time on it, but Transpire is a technology consultancy based out of Melbourne, wholly Australian owned, and our goal and mission is to transform and inspire through building digital technology with our clients while having an inclusive design and universal design mindset. So this talk is um, aimed at everyone. It's aimed at um, your developers, designers, product owners, managers, leaders, or anybody responsible for building um, applications, be it web or mobile. Although we'll be using a lot of um, native application case studies, it's generic enough that it could be used across, you know, um, you know, the processes of building websites as well. As I said, it's not a technical talk. So we will start by just painting a picture of how we typically experience uh, starting projects with our clients and where accessibility fits into the dialogue. We'll then go through lots of the do's and don'ts, again, mo mostly around methodology and process, and we'll finish up with some useful resources. So I'll hand it over to Kira. So we're gonna start with the reality um, and so for many people who work within uh, the product delivery space, you may have seen these product sliders. So we use them at the start of a project kickoff um, in which we talk to clients about how to prioritise um, their priorities through a project. So unfortunately, the reality for many um, product teams is that accessibility quickly falls to the wayside when things like time, scope and budget are included. Uh, at Transpire, a few years ago, we made it a commitment that accessibility was no longer a line item or a consideration. It was just something that you got when you worked with us. We made it an unspoken non-negotiable, and it was just something that you got. We don't proclaim to be the best accessibility experts on the market, um, but we do promise that it's one of our core values and that um, it's always front of mind with us. So that brings us to our do's and don'ts. Um, so do create your minimum accessible level. So one of our most recent projects, thankfully creating an accessible um, app was front of mind for them. As a design team, during our project kickoff, we decided that we needed to create our bare minimum accessibility level. So we called that our accessibility acceptance criteria, which is a bit of a product delivery um, jargon um, that we do. So. Here we've got no autoplay, or if you're going to have um, motion, it needs to be very slow. We talk about touch states and the size of those touch states and the distance they are from each other. We make sure that those touch states are labelled. Now on mobile phones, you've got dynamic font sizing. We have that on web as well. Um, and it's making sure that we accommodate those, which for Android, pretty much comes out of the box because of the myriad of Android devices that you have. But when you come to iOS, they've only recently started to adapt and change their sizes, and dynamic fonts don't come um, out of the box for that. So it's good design and a lot of conversations that need to be considered there. We make sure that images and text are grouped accordingly, and that images have alt text with them. We talk about colour contrast, and we try to apply the 4.5 to 1 ratio wherever we can. Um, and we check that through applications like Fun Funkify. So that brings us to our first don't. 
So don't assume that the baseline acceptance criteria will be used. So we had our baseline acceptance criteria. The entire delivery team knew what their responsibilities were in regards to that. And the only issue was that speaking about it had fallen to the wayside and time and competing um, conflicting priorities had kind of come into play. So we discovered that our accessibility had fallen to the wayside through our first accessibility testing that we ran. And so with the help of our users, we, we found gaps. Here's a fail that we caught along the way. Doesn't say what time the checking is there, or if I missed that. Oh, it's got me checking. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? I guess mm -hmm. uh, is it telling me I've got to check in, or uh, what time checking opens, mm -hmm. or I can check in now mm -hmm. to do it? It doesn't say. It doesn't tell me that it's a link. So. As you can see there, um, that particular user was born blind. Uh, so he was using VoiceOver on iOS to use an airline app to w work out, I guess, a, he was performing a task that we'd asked him to do, which I think was around getting his boarding pass. Uh, so as you can see there, he struggled when he got to check in because it wasn't labelled correctly. Now, thankfully, one of our developers was sitting in the room at the time because that's something that we believe in at Transpire is bringing everyone into those testing sessions. Um, and that issue was rectified by the end of the day by quickly changing the label to say that it was a button. So part of, in an effort to improve our communication, we, um, we use a system called JIRA to create our digital products. And basically, it just sets tasks and allows us to scope out how a particular component can work. So we customised our view of this, which you can see here, there's an acceptance criteria session within that. So previously, it had been a copy and paste. Um, it was pre-filled out. And so what we've changed about that is that during our conversations and our backlog refinements, we now have the space to talk about that. It's brought in front of mind, where we talk about the touch targets, we talk about the colour contrast, and we talk about what the voice will announce. So here you can see that it says check in, button. Another handy tip for designers in the room, I'm a designer, is that I copy and paste the acceptance criteria into my sketch file or Illustrator files and have it right next to me so that I know exactly line by line what I need to do. Um, I'd use colour contrast analyzer on my Mac to be able to check the colour contrast. Emil. Thanks, Kira. So, do test with a wide range of user types. So, the people who are designers and practitioners appreciate and understand the ability to be able to validate often. So, the challenges we've found over the past is that people with um, various accessibility needs are often not signing up to uh, market research recruitment databases. So over the, you know, our plan always is to um, test with users every sprint or every two weeks um, and test with five people. And our plan and vision always was to have one out of those five to be, to be an individual who is living with uh, vision impairment, you know, um, hearing impairment, cognitive impairment, dexterity or mobility impairments. However, we have found with our current partners that it is just a struggle to find people. So when we had briefs such as what you see on the screen, which is a total of five participants. Um, you know, one should have, well, across the, you know, across the 20%, the we would like people with vision impairment, which is not short-sighted or long-sighted, but, uh, you know, low vision or blind and use assistive technologies or people with physical impairments or one with cognitive impairments. But unfortunately, the type of people we're getting in were people who had glasses and didn't even know accessibility features existed on their phone. So this is probably the only plug I'm going to make is uh, Intopia, an amazing work that they've done with us trying to, say again? Very subtle. Very subtle. <laughs> yeah, subtle plug, thanks to Sarah, Adam, Stuart and the team, to find us people um, that fit our brief. And so instead of having to test one in every five in every session, we've changed our tactic to have a dedicated session with people with accessibility requirements. And so we can pretty much plan the whole day. The other um, benefit of you know, testing with people with access needs is that not only do we build empathy with our developers, testers, product owners, 
but also we have a, you know, now and again have an aha moment for ourselves. So the image you see on the screen is depicting how, oop, and this is where tech's going to cause some issues because the cabling is going to be flickering, but I'll keep talking. Um, so our assumptions was that people who use voiceover or talkback would be um, tapping on the screen and just moving their finger around the screen um, looking for you know, words to be spoken and they were just browsing. But in reality what we noticed was that almost every single person who has voiceover or talkback um, uses the left and right gestures to actually skip forward or back in content. And that totally changed the way we thought about the screen and how we designed it. I do apologize if the screen is causing you issues with flicking, maybe, maybe not look until this cable decides to settle itself. So, that's okay. Next one. Don't shy away from challenging brand guidelines. As you're a designer, I'm sure you've come across many um, stakeholders or clients who give you a brand guideline or a style guide. Often it's designed for print. Um, and as always, often it's been, used, uh, been produced by um, agencies or design consultancies who are not across accessibility. So many times our designers, and we are a consultancy, so we get given brand and uh, style guidelines that are just not accessible, especially around color contrast and also font. So hopefully if you can see on the screen, this is three examples of recent clients of ours. You know, one being an airline, one being a bank, and the other one being a not-for-profit government organization. Where on the left of each screen, at left of each section, you'll see that the color contrast ratio doesn't meet the minimum AA standard required by WCAG. So what we've had to do is have conversations with brand, marketing, product owners, and challenge them this, and tell them, listen, this is not good. This is not going to be a great product for you and may actually even cause troubles down the line. So through those open conversations, we've managed to modify the colors for our applications you know, to try and meet the 4.5 minimum ratio requirement. We don't always get it right. The perfect example being on the far left where we've gone from 1.9 and we've managed to push it to 3.7 to 1. We still can't get it to the, um, the, the minimum requirements that we want. But it's still within brand and it's much better than the original. Kira talked about custom fonts or fonts in general in native applications. So that's another tricky one to be aware of as a developer and a designer. Here's an example of Montserrat, which is a brand custom font for one of our clients. And the way it's rendered at the top, which is slightly thicker in weight in, in Kira's design program, is much different to how actually iOS and iPhone render the font. Now this is quite subtle. Many of you may not be able to see the difference. But for many other fonts, they actually, the differences are a lot bigger. So the reason that we recommend designing with um, native fonts in mind is because it allows for readability. You know, it's been optimized for smaller screens because the manufacturer of those phones have designed those fonts. Um, the third one is it's been tried and tested and it supports a dynamic text. Now what we're not saying is don't use custom fonts, but just to be prepared that when you do use them, to allow for a little bit more time as a designer or a developer to make sure that you can test those dynamic text size changes to ensure that you're not getting odd wrapping and things like that. We're going to keep plowing through while we have tech issues. comes to the part of the talk where there's a video, so <laughs> highly convenient <laughs> that we're having tech issues right now. Um, but what I will talk to while we wait for tech support to come back, which is here, um, is about think about your accessibility at a screen level. So, uh, um, so think about your accessibility at a screen level. So it's all well and good to make sure that 
you adhere to you know that baseline accessibility criteria that we talked about earlier but if you aren't thinking about how the grouping or at that whole screen scenario works you're going to um, strike issues so So you can see there that that flight, well, for people that can see that a flight, um, it's a delayed flight. So we've announced that. Um, but what we haven't really clearly done is told you what your new expected flight time is. So that kind of came through our QA um, to us. And she handed it over to me and said, what do you think of this? And I said, I think that's rubbish. Uh, you know, if I got told that, um, I'd be like, what the hell is, what time do I need to be at the airport? What's happening? Um, so we decided that that wasn't good enough and we, we interjected at that point in time and said, look, what we're going to do is rather than just label this as it comes out of the box, we're going to make sure that we group this well. Um, and this is basically the change that we made. Oh, delays. <laughs> so basically, I'll move on from this and tell you what it says. So it says, your flight from Melbourne Tullamarine to Sydney that has been scheduled at 4 p.m. will now depart at 5 p.m. and your new estimated time of arrival is 6.25 p.m. So we completely changed what the voiceover, I guess, comes out of the box using. And we showed what, I guess, a person that has full vision would understand by those differences of colour um, and font weights. So that really wasn't a huge delay or um, one, using the word delay, but it wasn't, you know, something that was overly complicated in terms of dev. So it's something that, you know, having a quick conversation, you can really make an app that's good from an accessibility perspective or ticks a box to something that's actually exceptional and reduces anxiety for people. Oh, there we go. There's a, I'll let you watch it, actually. Yeah. Flight from Melbourne, Tula Marine, Sydney, scheduled to depart at 4 p.m. and arrive at 5.25 p.m. Will now depart at 5 p.m. and estimated arrival will be at 6.25 p.m. I just want to interject. That always gives me goosebumps how a simple little change like that, without even changing the screen, can make an amazing difference to someone who can't see. It's you. You're up. Oh, it's me. Right, I can keep talking here. I'm not going to touch any cable, so I'm going to remain absolutely still. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't let accessibility training slip within your team. So there, as we talked about, accessibility is very important for us. But thank you. Oh, we've got 20 minutes. No, it's two minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, it's important to be uh, remain fresh and up to date. So we send our developers to you know WWDC conference run by um, Apple or the Google I/O conference. We remain across you know um, Google Material Design and uh, you know Apple's Human Interface Guidelines. We use various tools. We've actually um, started an initiative with Telstra and have put the. Um, created this website called Apps for All, which is a bit of an MVP, but I would love for you guys to all jump on board and tell me what you think. And as well as that, um, as Kira mentioned, we get our teams involved in you know, usability sessions and empathy sessions. We work closely with Kelly Schultz from Telstra and Customer Inc, where we've put together a little cards that help build empathy and education around various impairments and disabilities. And um, we basically ensure our developers, designers, product owners, now and again, just jump into their phone, turn on accessibility features, and just remind themselves of the gestures, the features, and the functionality, so that we can then guide our clients as we start talking about this. So a couple of tips. If you do use VoiceOver or TalkBat, please first set up the shortcut. The number of times we have laughing fits and as we see our clients have anxiety fits when they've turned on TalkBack and VoiceOver to experiment but then they have no idea how to turn it off. And they get into a panic and they just literally put their phone in their pockets. So that's a quick tip for you. Um, as phone factors are changing, for example, iPhones now remove the home button, it also changes the way you use the phone and therefore some of the gestures that come out of the box. So be across those. 
And lastly, um, don't assume that just because, for example, you can see and you're using um, you know, talkback and voiceover, that that's the exact same way that somebody else uses that feature. Get those users in. Okay, discuss and disagree. So if you know me, I like to have a good conversation and a discussion. It's not an argument, it's a discussion. Um, I'm just going to use a perfect example from a case study that we recently worked on. On the left-hand side, you see an image of a part of an app that we've built called Dream Lab, which helps to speed up cancer research. It's owned by Vodafone Foundation, and it's in partnership with the Research Institute, Garvin Institute. And you, as a user, select a project to work on, and the projects have assigned a country. So on the screen, you'll see the Vodafone Foundation logo, the Garvin Institute logo, and in the middle against the project, you see the Australian flag that tells you the country that the project belongs to. So, the whole notion of decorative um, content came into play, where our developers wanted to stick by the, their guns in terms of what you know, the guidelines around Apple were, in that, well, if it's decorative content, we shouldn't actually have talkback or voiceover speak it. Kira was um, arguing that, well, there's an important information that's being missed around the partnership between Vodafone Foundation and the Garvin Institute, so therefore, the user, the user should be able to hear that. The developer goes, well, it's not important, they can still complete their task, Kira said, but what if someone has low vision but still has um, text-to-speech on? They can see something on the screen, but they can't hear it. Back and forth, back and forth, I get involved, our lead designer and developers all get involved, and although we sort of backed down on that occasion, what was really inspiring and, and great was that we had four people in the kitchen discussing, you know, raising their voice around the importance of accessibility. We were all bought in. It was a really great example of what it means to be empowered. So, resources. Kira. So, yeah, we've talked about a few different things during this um, short session, but there's a few resources that we recommend um, you check out. So Apps for All that we've talked about previously, it's got tips for all members of the product team. So whether you're a designer, a developer, a product owner, or a QA, there's session, sections in there that will help you improve um, how you look at accessibility within your role. We've got color contrast tools for designers. So color contrast analyzer, which is available on um, Mac and um, PC, it's from Vision Australia, is quite a handy tool to make sure that you're adhering to color contrast. Uh, Funkify is a plugin with Chrome, and there's also another app called Colorable, which is, uh, sits in the top um, of your Mac settings. It is a paid one, though. Um, platform guidelines. So we can't stress how being across Google Material guidelines and the Apple human-centered guidelines um, you need to be. So especially when you're having those um, arguments or passionate conversations, as we like to call it, with your developers. When you're across those Apple guidelines as much as they are, um, it really um, strengthens the conversation. Now, a really good um, tool on Android is the Accessibility Scanner app. So that um, you can download that in. It takes a screen grab of the screen that you're wanting to analyze, and it actually tells you if it adheres to uh, the standards or not. So it'll flag anything, and then you can just do a quick check through that. So it speeds up the QA process immensely. So our final takeaways um, for today is basically start somewhere. So creating an accessible app is an evolution. As long as you're starting to do something at some point in time, you're on the right roads. There's too many apps in the App Store that aren't accessible at all. Uh, it's OK to get it wrong. So it's the whole good, better, best that Amir lives by. Uh, showcase what being accessible like has to people. So whether that's to your delivery teams, whether it's to your clients, um, it, showing them the impact that making something work well does will get you inroads. Uh, don't underestimate the benefits of grouping, as we saw, um, and don't and you know go the extra mile if you have to to make it better. Um, and keep up the conversation. So Maya Angelou was a American poet and activist. Um, and this is one of our favorite quotes. So do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, do better. Thank you. Thanks. Alley Camp, October 2018.